Right, so today's talk, which is sort of the final talk in this series, in this walkthrough of the onion. After this, we've pretty much gone through all of the big systems. Uh, but today's talk is going to be about the multiplayer system, the network multiplayer system. Um, uh, so this is quite a complex system, so we'll see how, how long it takes to, to go through it. Uh, the purpose of this system is to, and, and I'm, I'm, the, the purpose of this system is to implement uh, some synchronization of game state between multiple players on different machines. So the synchronization happens over some kind of network. It's all TCP/IP underneath, but it might be over Steam or PlayStation, PlayStation Network or or some other some other network. So that's the purpose of this system, and. I'm not going to be talking about any low-level network stuff like sockets and stuff like that. We've already covered that. I'm just going to be talking about this sort of synchronization layer, uh, layer of, of handling multiplayer and network play. So the mechanism we provide for this is kind of manual. And, and the reason for this is that different games uh, have different ideas about what they need to sync, like what what, act, what is actually the game state that needs to be replicated uh, between different peers or clients in a game. Uh, you could say, well, why, why don't we just sync everything? Why don't we just synchronize the position of every unit and, and every particle effect and every sound and everything? But that is usually much too expensive. Uh, we don't have an endless supply of, of bandwidth, of network bandwidth, and and sending all that data will be prohibitive, especially when it comes to, if you look at a server that might have to send, send out data to 64 or 128 players. There are always, uh, there are always things we want to do, like if, if, we, get, if we get more, net, more network bandwidth, which we have gotten with, with broadband and, uh, and that being more common, we might want to use that to uh, increase the number of players we can have simultaneously. Uh, so even even though we have more broadband now than we used to have years ago, we still probably don't want to just sync everything. So so that means that we need some kind of manual process for uh, for doing the synchronization. The uh, the game developer, the product developer, has to decide what the features are that needs to be synced and has to tell uh, tell the engine about that. So the process has to be manual to an extent. Of course, we try to, to help the game developer with that as much as possible from the engine side, but, but the setup needs to be manual. Uh, so if you start digging into our network code uh, in the engine, uh, which you find here in application network, uh, you will probably find that the, the code in here, there's a lot of code. Uh, for these systems, and it's kind of complicated. It has multiple layers. I'll, I'll go through all these layers um, later. Uh, but layers like, like basic transport layers for sending messages, and then higher levels on top of that for, for synchronizing game state. And the layers are not always cleanly separated, I would say. There is some abstraction leakage between the different layers and some couplings that, that shouldn't be there. Um, we also have multiple backends, so uh, we can run it over LAN or Steam or PSN and so on. And and trying to trying to figure out uh, sort of what happens uh, in the network code is kind of tricky. It's hard to follow follow the the code paths and uh, hard to reason about it. And and that applies to network code in general because you have this this weird thing where things can fail which you're not you're not that used to when you program usually when you when you write like printf hello it's going to print f hello no matter what but once you deal with networks messages may disappear other clients may go down or come up and go down and come up again or whatever uh, the events from all these uh, different network players come in sort of at whatever time when they happen to be delivered by the network system, they can be delayed and be delivered later. Uh, so we, it's, it's hard to get a complete picture of what's going on and it's hard to reason about like, 
well, what happens, what are the possible things that can happen in the situation I am in right now? What are the things that, that can go wrong? And, and honestly, the, the code doesn't really help. As I said, there's some unhealthy coupling between the layers going on. And I would say the, the code is kind of messy and, and it's hard to read and hard to follow. And I, I think it would, pro, it, it would definitely benefit from a cleanup and sort of a rewrite slash cleanup of, of, of the network code in order to, uh, to make it easier to, to see what is happening in the code. Um, so, so I would say in general that this system is, the network system is not one of our proudest systems. When, whenever you go into the code, it's a little bit of feeling of, of unease. So one question to, uh, that's kind of important to think about is that, I, I mean, it's not terrible. I mean, I've seen, there's a lot of terrible code out there. This is not terrible code, but I, compared to, compared to the rest of the code we have in the end, I would say that the network system is definitely one of the hardest to get into and one of the hardest to to reason about and try to fit in your head what's what's going on so it's it's important to ask i think to self reflect a bit and ask ourselves well why is this system bad or or why is it worse than our other system what what's the cause for this for this kind of messy situation that we're in with with the network and i think there's multiple issues uh, to begin with, as I said, network is, is a hard problem to begin with compared to other systems because you can't, you're not just dealing with the code you write and the, you wrote and the code that's running on your machine. You're dealing with the whole system, like what happens on every other machines. Uh, you have to handle external events, things failing which are beyond your control. Uh, so it's, it's a much more tricky problem to begin with and sort of trying to fit in your head all the things that can happen uh, to the different nodes in the network uh, makes it harder. Uh, it's also the fact that we we try to abstract. Uh, we have abstracted the different backends, so we have abstracted over uh, PSN and LAN and Steam and Xbox Live and all all other possible backends that can be running the actual uh, the actual network layer. But these backends are not exactly the same they work kind of differently, uh, which makes it hard to make a, a clean abstraction that sort of encompasses the, these different behaviors. And that's, that's where you can see some of the abstraction leakage I, I talked about. Like sometimes we need to open sort of a back door because, because Steam needs to do something in a particular way that, that other systems don't. Uh, so that's one source that, one source of like, complexity and messiness uh, in this code. It's also the fact that that we support running running the, the network in different configurations. We can run it either in sort of a peer-to-peer -peer mode when there is no there's no central host. Everybody's on an equal footing and everybody will communicate with everybody else. Uh, but you can also tr run it in a more traditional like host client setup where one machine has the major responsibility for 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 the uh, for the game state and is responsible for communicating that out to the other people so um, so that sort of complicates things more you have this boolean flag that tells the system to run in either one mode or another so whenever you read the code you sort of have to think in your head oh, what happens in this case if i'm in peer-to-peer -peer mode and what happens with the code in this case if i'm in server client mode so it's another thing in in addition to all these things that can fail over the network that you need to think about you need to think about this things thing too and do sort of special handling for these two situations i would also say that there are parts of the parts of the problem of synchronizing game state that we didn't fully understand when we first wrote the systems like failure cases that we that we didn't really think about uh, such as the need for handshake uh, in the initial setup. I'll, I'll talk a bit, I'll go into that later, but uh, yeah, let's just say that we didn't have a, a complete grasp of all the things that, that can sort of go wrong. So we had to, to add that uh, understanding later uh, when the initial design had, had already been made. And yeah, so not understanding the problem. And then there's also been 
scope creep or feature creep over time as we've added more and more stuff to the system that wasn't in the original design. Things like quality of service, drop in play, migration, uh, priorities for, for messages and so on. Uh, and these things have been added by multiple people, uh, which can be a problem, I think, because I don't, I don't advocate that one system should always be owned by, by a single person, but it can be a problem when a lot of people sort of come and go into the code. Uh, they tend to be focused just on putting the particular feature that they want to add in, and they will sort of not care about understanding the whole system maybe, and definitely not care about rewriting the whole system in order to better fit their feature because they don't want to get into a huge system that's that's they don't feel ownership to. So what tends to happen is that they sort of patch in uh, the thing they're 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 adding in a way that might not be might, might not be the most elegant way. It's sort of adds on an additional thing to a system that already exists. And when you have that happening multiple times, you get this thing added, this thing added, this thing added, and you get sort of a, a freak thing with, with a lot of extra stuff bolted on and it gets harder to reason about the system. And I think, I actually think this is the, the main reason for, for the messiness in this code, that it's, it's hard, it's hard to, it's hard to debug this code because in, to set up a, a debugging session, you need multiple machines, you need to synchronize them somehow, you need to drive them, either remote drive them yourselves or get a whole team of developers in to, to test drive it. It's hard to think about, it's hard, it's really hard to think about all the things that can happen. I think, I think in, as programmers in general, we're, we're quite comfortable with serial code, like that's, that's pretty easy. This happens and this and this and this but once you bring in uh, the sort of asynchronous things that things can happen on different nodes uh, at, at random times like at any time you might get a message from someone else uh, that you're not expecting and and then again add to this the possibility of failure that messages might not arrive they might arrive in the wrong order and so on uh, and it's also hard to reduce problems like you know setting up a debug session getting the exact order of messages that cause something bad to happen to, to replay again uh, might be tricky. So I think all of these things that the system is so hard to reason about leads to a lack of confidence as a developer. Uh, so you're not, one, when you're in the network system and, and sort of programming, you feel that you don't have the full picture, you don't have a full mental model in your head of all the thing, all the things can get ha that can happen in the system, and all the things that might go wrong, or all the things that you might not have thought about. Uh, so you always have in, in the back of your head, sort of, there's probably a lot of things that I I haven't thought about in this situation, and this tends to to lead to fear of refactoring, uh, because you know that well at least the code is working right now; it has been bug tested. So I. I, and I, at least it's working right now, and I don't have the full mental model where I feel I have total control of what's going on in this code. So, and I don't have a good testing procedure where I can, if I change something, I can validate that it still works. And that, that means that, well, you know the code is working right now, but if you change, you have no idea because your mental model can't tell you what's happened because the problem is too complicated with all these failure modes and multiple things. Um, so your mental model doesn't give you a clear answer and also debugging doesn't give, give you a clear answer because it's too hard to set up a full debugging test to, to test the, the network situation. So what tends to happen is that instead of refactoring and making the code nicer and putting in your new feature uh, in a good way, you just try to touch as little as possible. And then when multiple people do that again and again and add new features without refactoring and making things nicer, they add more complexity to the system. So the system gets harder and harder to understand. And, and this sort of sends you into a downward spiral where you get into a situation where nobody really feels that they understand the system and they, nobody dares to touch it and they just add more and more stuff on it. So I think that's, that's what led this code into a messy situation. And I think like, a big refactor, a big rethink is the only way to, 
to climb up uh, out of that well. Um, but of course, you will pay a cost for that because right now we have a system that's working and to do a complete refactor or a big rewrite of it uh, will introduce bugs, of, sh of course, and it will take time to, to clean all that up. But I think it's something that at some point is, is necessary to do in order to shape up the system a bit. Uh, so that's general about, about, uh, about why the system looks the way it does and what we should do about it. So now I'll try to go through the actual system and, and all the different parts of it. Uh, so let's start with, with a little overview of networking concepts, just so that we're, we have a common vocabulary of things to talk about. So there are multiple parts of the networking that we need to implement. Um, the first one before, before a network game can even happen, before a multiplayer game can even start, is what we call matchmaking. And the purpose of matchmaking is to somehow find other players to play with and establish a network connection to them so that we can talk to them. And this typically happens over in some kind of network system, like Steam has functionality for this. You can find Steam lobbies, you can send invites and do stuff like that. PlayStation Network has its own functionality for doing this. Same for Xbox Live. And in addition to those existing systems, we also have our own LAN system for doing it, for, for finding, finding players on the local network. Um, we don't have any generic system sort of for doing this over the internet because uh, you can't really do it over the internet without having a common server to talk to that can help you, help you punch through firewalls, sort of router firewalls. Everybody, pretty much everybody is behind some kind of firewall these days. Uh, and in order to make a connection to someone else, you need, you need an external server to punch through that firewall. So you need something like Steam or, or PSN or something that can, uh, can, can do the task for you. Uh, we have, we identify peers, clients and servers in the networks by a peer ID, a new unique identifier that we assign to each, uh, to each peer. And the reason here is that, like, yeah, different systems, different backends here might have different ways of identifying uh, peers or players. And we want sort of a unified thing that we can use across these different systems. Uh, so we've introduced the 64-bit identifier uh, for this purpose. So that's how we know who we are talking to. Um, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, then uh, switching to going from like top down, going bottom up. At the, at the bottom of our system, we have the, what we call the transport layer. So the transport layer is responsible for the network communication itself. So it can send and receive messages to peers. So it takes it as input, a peer, uh, a peer ID, and a block of data that we want to send to that peer, or a block to be filled with data to receive from a peer. Uh, typically, in some of these, not in all of these backends, but in some of these backends, uh, the matchmaking needs to sort of open up channels in the transport layer. We don't have connections open by default in the transport layer, uh, to talk to just anybody on the internet. Uh, we may have to, the matchmaking may have to provide us with communications keys or a socket or something in order to, to talk to a particular person. But that is kind of system dependent too. So again, complexity because different backends do this in, in different ways. Uh, so the transport layers just sends raw messages, blocks of, blocks of bytes. On top of that, we have what we call the connection layer. And the purpose of the connection layer is to fix a problem with the transport layer. So network communication is, in general is unreliable. Uh, you're not guaranteed that messages will arrive and they might arrive out of order unless you're using TCP. But for, uh, for games, you typically don't want to use TCP because it has delays uh, various kinds of delays built into it. So you typically want to use um, UDP instead. 
uh, and UDP transport is unreliable and unordered. So we need to, since we're not using TCP, we need to, we need to implement our own reliable messaging system so that we can send messages and know that they will arrive and know that they will arrive in the right order. So we need to implement that ourselves on top of the transport layer. And that's the purpose of the connection layer. Um, we also have a mechanism for, so our mechanism for sending messages are to use RPC messages. And that's an RPC, RPC stands for remote procedure call. And what that means is that we, uh, we create sort of Lua functions that you can call uh, that will result in the same function being called on a particular pair. So you call a Lua function and say, I want to call this Lua function on this particular pair. The parameters that you pass to the Lua function, the name of the Lua function, uh, or the ID, maybe I should say, of the Lua function and its parameters get encoded into a network message and sent to the peer. On the peer side, it's unpacked again from this packed byte representation that we can send over the network. It's unpacked, uh, turned into regular Lua call again, and then you get it into, uh, into Lua. So, so that's our general messaging mechanism, doing these kind of Lua calls to a different peer. Uh, so when, it's, when it comes to synchronizing game state, we have two mechanisms for doing that. One is these RPC messages. So you can use that to synchronize game state. For example, you can send a message that says, uh, my name is Nicholas. And now all the other peers knows that your name is Nicholas. And if they want have some state that they want to inform the other peers around, they can send messages. Uh, but all that message sending becomes kind of tedious and hard to keep track of. So we have another mechanism for synchronizing state, which we call game object. So a game object is an object that exists um, in the multiplayer layer. It's sort of an abstract object. Uh, it has a set of properties, uh, a set of fields that can be assigned values like numbers or strings. And, and then these objects are then automatically synchronized between the clients. So when you're working with game object, you don't really have to think about what messages you send. Uh, you can just create a game object in the network layer, create a game object, uh, assign the fields. So you can create a game object representing a player, assign the hit points to 100, set the name to Niklas. And then behind the scenes, the network layer will synchronize these properties. So all the other peers uh, that are participating in the same game uh, we'll see that game object too and see that its name is Niklas and its points is 100 points. Of course, it may take some time for this synchronization to be happen because messages needs to go over the network, but eventually they will have a game object with the same state as, as your game object. Um, game objects are always owned by one particular peer. So of all these peers that are participating in the network game, one is authoritative, and that's the authoritative person is the only one that can change the properties of the game object. If someone else wants to do it, they have to notify the owner and say, oh, could you please change the score of your player to this or something like that. Uh, so it's always the, the owner is authoritative. And, and it should be noted that these are these game objects are sort of abstract objects. It's just it's like JSON data. It's just a bunch of properties they don't correspond to anything in the engine. I mean, they could, you could create a unit and then you could create a game object to represent that unit and sort of uh, store its position and store its health or whatever. Uh, but there's no requirement in the system that the game objects actually match anything else in the game. That is all up to uh, the person writing the gameplay code to sort of uh, figure out that connection and, and, and set it up. Uh, and I would say that if you're writing a network game, my recommendation is definitely to use game objects uh, as much as possible rather than messages, just because it's, it's easier to reason about. You don't have to think about who got what message, what message do you need to send to who. Uh, the synchronization just happens automatically in the background. Um, more concepts. So a game session 
a game session is sort of what we call a network game, uh, which is the scope in which these game objects exist. So when I create the game object, all the, all the players, all the pairs that are in the same game session, that are playing the same network game, will be synchronized. And if one of them creates a game object, they will synchronize to me. So that's sort of the, the scope for these uh, synchronizations. And, um, and this is, uh, peers can enter and leave a game session. And as I said earlier, the game session can either be peer-to-peer -peer or client-server. In peer-to-peer, -peer, the owner of each of these game objects is responsible for synchronizing it. So the owner will send out the network messages to the other peers. In the, if you're in the, in the client server model, uh, the server will own most objects. The clients will still own the objects representing their own players because they need to modify them. But all the, all the other game objects like the NPC objects will all be owned by the server. Whereas in a peer to peer architecture, that ownership can sort of be shared. Responsibility can be shared among the peers to distribute the load a bit. But in the client server model, the server will own more, most objects. And also all messages will go through the server. So for the client object, client owned objects in this scenario, like my player, if I change it, I will only send a synchronization message to the server that says, well, this uh, game object has changed. And the server will then uh, be responsible for broadcasting that out to the other peers and say, oh, this, you need to update this game object. Um, so drop in by drop in we means uh, drop in is what happens when a new client or a new peer joins an already ongoing game session so you already have a bunch of people playing and someone new comes in and then of course that that new person must be updated with all the game objects that already exist in this game session to get that new person uh, to the same state because that's kind of what we promise with the game session that everybody that participates will eventually reach a synchronized state where, where they all have the same game objects with the same properties. Um, dropout is the opposite thing when a client leaves a game session, either, either deliberately, like I press a button to exit the game, or there's a disconnection, uh, the game might have crashed, or the network might have gone down, or part of the network might have gone down or the network might be unresponsible for a while, but then come back up again, but it's so long that we consider the peer disconnected. So lots of different possible situations. And if, that, if this happens, if someone drops out, then someone needs to take ownership of, of the game objects that that client used to own, because every game object needs to have some kind of owner. So in this case, we need a mechanism for transferring ownership of these game objects. Um, another important concept is encoding and packing. All these messages that we send, the RPC messages and the synchronization messages for the game objects, we want to pack them to be as small as possible because um, we want to minimize network use so that we can have as many players as possible in the same game. Um, so we use different encoding and packing schemes to achieve that. Uh, another concept is quality of service and the purpose of quality of service is to figure out how much data we should send to each pair. So we could, we could, send, uh, we could send every position of every object, every frame, like, just like bombard the pair with, with, with messages. But if we do that, we might flood the bandwidth of of that peer which means that our messages won't arrive and uh, something will disconnect eventually so since we only have a limited bandwidth to each peer uh, we want to do two things first we want to figure out sort of what kind of the how big that bandwidth is how much much data can we send to that peer which is kind of hard to figure out and then we also want to make sure that we don't send more than that that cap that we limit ourselves to sending that amount of data and thirdly we also want to make sure that the data we actually send is the most important data if we can't send sell if we can't send all the data we want to make sure that the most important data get, gets through and this is kind of a tricky problem in general all of these three parts of this problem is is tricky 
well, limiting what limiting the amount of data you send is kind of simple, but but the other two parts are tricky, like measuring the bandwidth is tricky and sort of figuring out what, what the priority of the different kinds of data is, is really tricky. So, so before, before diving into this system on the C side, um, I wanted to show it from, show it how it looks in gameplay, just because this is such a big system that is kind of hard to grasp um, so I definitely want to, uh, oh, I have it here, right? Yeah, I definitely want to show how it's, how it all works in Lua so that you have some, some concept of that. Uh, so this, this example code here is from the Stingray testbed project. Um, that's a project that we distribute that has some, some simple tests in it and it has a, a very simple a very simple network test uh, that runs on all our different backends. It's it's really minimalistic. It, it's not really a full game, uh, but it at least show you how to set up everything. So the configuration of the network is done in a JSON file called global network config uh, that has the uh, the setup of the network. Maybe I need to do this. So, uh, and this is the way this is set up for, for the testbed project. It defines the network type. As I said, it can be both peer-to-peer -peer or client-to-server. Uh, then it defines a number of types and uh, the encoding or packing for these different types. So these are the different types of data that we can send either, either in, in RPC messages or as game object synchronizations. Um, so a bool is just a bool. It will be sent at a single bit, but for things like integers, we do range reduction. So you specify the range of the integer and we only use as many bits as are necessary to cover that range. Uh, for a float, we do the same thing. We do range reduction and quantization. So the, the range that we want to use and the number of bits we use to represent the float, so it will be represented as a fixed point value within this range. Uh, same for position, rotation. Yeah, all of these are, are encoded. And strings will be, if you use strings, they will only use as many characters as, as are in the string, obviously. Uh, then we have the definitions of the messages. So each message is defined by its name and then a list of uh, arguments. So you see some of these messages don't have any arguments. This message has a string, single string argument and this one too, but they could use any one of these types that are defined here as arguments and they could have multiple arguments uh, as well. And we don't use return values because that doesn't really make sense because because the message is performed asynchronously, so the return value wouldn't come until later. So if you want to return something from a message, you will have to send the message back instead. And so these become Lua functions in the RPC class. So in the, in the Lua code later, we'll be able to do RPC uh, wants to drop in, and then the peer that we want to send it to. Um, and then we have the game object definitions, so the names of the different game object types and the list of their fields or their properties. So each field has a name and then a type, which again is a type from this, from this list here. So it's pretty straightforward. It's a definition of, of a network layer. Um, then we have these Lua files. Why isn't it indexing these files? That's weird. All right. Du, du, du. So the network scene. Um, oh, I installed the ah, 
and install it. Little syntax highlighter on this machine. Well, anyway. Um, so the um, the network they're, they're all called scenes. That's just the way this project is set up. Each each screen is is a separate scene. So the first one here, the network scene is used to pick the network backend that you want to use. We can test uh, multiple different backends, and it will just show a menu with the different backends like LAN, Steam, PSN, Xbox Live, and based on which backend you pick, it will go into one of these uh, one of these backends uh, and allow you to to run it. Um, Let's look at the LAN one first. So that's kind of the simplest one. Um, so the, the all of these, and this is sort of the matchmaking layer uh, that will, uh, if we go back here, we have one, this game scene file, which actually drives the network game. So that's where you end up when you're inside the game session. Uh, so these two, the LAN one and the Steam one, take care of the matchmaking and gather all the players to get ready for, for starting the game. So that's what happens here. And both of these matchmaking things are based on kind of a state machine uh, that has separate states here. Uh, you're, either, you're either started started your just enter this screen or you're hosting a lobby or you're you're in a lobby or you're searching for a lobby to join so and then we have um, we have separate update functions here based on the state so in the initial state when we haven't joined the lobby and we're not searching for a lobby we just present the menu to either create a lobby or find an existing lobby. And if we're creating a lobby, uh, we're calling Lua code in the network layer here to uh, initialize our LAN network client, um, creating a lobby on a specific port, setting some data for this lobby, and then we go into uh, the lobby state. And if you select find lobby, we go into the find lobby state. So in the lobby state, we uh, we have a lobby member, uh, which was set up here, uh, which was set up when we created the lobby. And if uh, we check with that lobby, if we are the host, and if we are the host, we, we show an option to start the game. Uh, and we also display a list of, list of members, members here. The member, the member list will, is automatically updated by the engine if, if someone joins or, joins or leaves. Uh, and if, if we are the host of the lobby and we select start, then we create this game scene um, that will that is responsible for the network game itself, and we call start server game on that game scene. Uh, we also set this we also set uh, a variable on the lobby, uh, a variable called the game session host, and this variable is used by the used to indicate that the game session has started. We're in the game, and that we are the host of this game. Uh, so this is actually used by the uh, by the client. So in the client code up here, here if we are the client, we check if the state is uh, we check if this game session host has been set on the lobby, and this is automatically synchronized by the engine. So once the once the host sets it, it will be reflected to all the other lobby members. And so the client will see this set here, and then the client will create its game scene and call start client game uh, to start uh, the client version of the actual network game. And find lobby here is most of that happens on the engine side. 
it it has a lobby browser which is an onion object used to find lobbies displays a list of these lobbies and if you pick uh, if you pick an object in this list we call onion functions to join that lobby and that will add us to the to the member list of that lobby so so that's how you get into a game either as a host or or as a client in in a LAN scenario. Uh, then we have the corresponding function in Steam. Uh, pretty similar setup. It has a bit more states because Steam actually has two systems for doing this. It has a lobby system and a game server system. Uh, but other than that, it's it's pretty similar. Um, we have update functions for these different states um, uh, and in the init state you select you can start start a new server or create a lobby or finding a server either on lawn or internet or create a lobby or finding a lobby and let's just look at the lobby stuff it works the same as on the pretty similar to on the land side we initialize the steam client in this case because we're going to use steam networking um, we create a Steam lobby and join it and the synchronization of the, of the lobby happens automatically and um, let's scroll down to the lobby code here yeah and the same thing here if we are the host of the lobby um, we have an option to starting the game and this and the same thing happens here with the game session host if we pick to start a game we will set the game session host and in the client code uh, we check for that and if it's set we we start it so pretty similar code but different functions for for calling the steam steam interface so let's look at the game scene so now we've created the matchmaking and we will drop into the game um, either through one of these functions where, where is it start uh, call start client yes so one of these functions either start server game on the server we call great game session uh, on the network to create the session where our game objects will live uh, and we set ourselves as the host of this this game session and on the client side it's kind of similar we create create the game session here and then we send an RPC message to the server uh, that we want to join the session uh, in game sessions the the host of the game session. So, so even in a peer-to-peer -peer game, the game session has a host. Someone owns the session, and the owner of the session is responsible for adding or kicking people from from the session. So, in this case, we send a message that we want to drop in. We want to join this session. This RPC call arrives on the server here uh, with this with the sender that sent this, and it will add this peer the sender to the game so this will join in uh, the client into this game session so at this point uh, clients and servers are all in the game session and we can start using game objects and um, synchronization messages so there's some code for that here some sample sample code yeah here uh, some sample code here for spawning a box in the game uh, so you can press a button to spawn a box and what happens it will create a game object game object of this type box which was one of the types defined if we go to the network config here you see that we have a box type here it has properties position rotation and hit points so we create that box, we initialize the position, the other values get default initialized, store it in a table and 
start using it. And then this, uh, this box will be synchronized to, to the other players. And they will get, let's see where that is. Uh, they will get the game object created message uh, when they receive this this synchronization that the game object has been created from the server and in in this case they will spawn uh, the corresponding unit on their side so the box will appear on on the other pairs computers um, so that's pretty much how that works so let's dig into the c code uh, we'll start at Start at the highest level first, which is the network class. So, so the network class represents sort of the whole of the uh, the whole of the network, and it's responsible for creating a game session or shutting down the game session when it has completed. We only support a single game session right now. You can't have multiple game sessions uh, going on, which is something you might want to add if we if we ever do a big refactor of the system. Uh, and it it it's created with a specific specific network backend. So this is uh, the backend that represents either either Steam or LAN or PlayStation Network or whatever backend we are running over. Uh, it also takes this network configuration and so on as parameters. So it keeps track of the game session. It also keeps track of uh, lobbies. Um, so it has a list, of, a list of the lobbies and a list of the other, other layers of the system. Uh, so, and the network backend looks like this. It's uh, the abstract interface for the network backend that gets implemented for the different types of backends we have. It keeps track of our peer ID, our identifier, and the transport layer, which is used for, for sending messages. Uh, yeah, so this, this is what is set up in Lua when you call init land client. You can look at what happens here. So init land client. Uh, it will get the network, which is a global object. And then on this network, uh, it, will it will create the land client object that represents the land backend. And then it will create the network with this uh, land backend. And the init steam client works the same way. Uh, and we can look at how what the land client does. Not a lot. It keeps track of the peer ID and it uh, also pumps the lobby browser and the transport layer when it gets updated. And the Steam client. About the same stuff, keeps track of the peer ID, which in the case of Steam is just the same as the Steam ID. We use the same 64 bits and updates the transport layer and also handles some, uh, some Steam uh, processing callbacks that we need to, need to do. So that's quite simple. So that's the sort of top layer. So let's flip it around and start looking at the network stack from bottom up. So at the lowest level, just above the sockets or whatever, we have the transport layer. As I said before, the transport layer is responsible for sending and receiving messages to a specific peer ID. We only talk about other peers in terms of their peer ID. And the interface looks like this. Um, 
it's an abstract interface because it will be for our different backends will implement it differently uh, so it keeps track of which pairs it can talk to as i said before it might be that the matchmaking layer needs to open ports in the transport layer so we might not be able to talk to every pair from the beginning uh, then we have function for sending and receiving data and these are just placeholder functions that uh, the matchmaker on some systems used to add uh, to add and remove ports in this layer. Then we have ugly stuff here, an authenticator. This is only used by the Steam layer, but because the abstractions are kind of leaky, it appears here. So that's probably something you want to refactor. Uh, the transport layer can also do simulation of bad connections. So we have something called a bad transport simulator. Uh, which can be used to simulate uh, a completely broken connection, uh, latencies in the connection, packet loss, that is dropped packages, uh, and so on, duplicated packages. Uh, so this is quite useful because when you want to test how your system behaves under bad network condition, it's kind of hard to set up, uh, hard to set up bad a bad network situation you can get some some software for doing that if you have multiple network cards you can route the traffic to your computer and have a, a software layer that can take care of dropping or delaying packages but but it's that's kind of a pain to set up too so it's it's really quite useful to have this inside the software layer itself where you can just turn it on so you can play a network game and say oh let's Oh, everything seems nice now because you're always testing on LAN, of course, uh, because that's where your machines are. Uh, but then you're like, oh, I wonder how this will perform. Will will the movements be smooth? Will the updates be nice if I if I have like 200 milliseconds of latency? And then you can just set that and, and test it. So, uh, and what happens when you use this web transport situation is that the transport layer will actually delay the messages and reorder them before sending them out to to the other peers. It's a useful feature. Um, so, just to give just to give a feel for how these things work on with our different backends, I'm going to talk about when I go through all these layers. I'm going to talk about what they do in LAN and what they do in Steam, so you can see how it kind of complicates things that that they are kind of different. Uh, I'm not going to talk about PlayStation Network and Xbox One because I am under NDA, of course, for those platforms, but but they are also different in interesting ways. Uh, so that adds to the complexity of this whole thing. So uh, in the LAN, in LAN mode, the peer ID will just be a random number, so random 64-bit number generated on each on each client when it boots up. And in the transport layer, we store a map because uh, on LAN, of course, we talk to other, we talk to our peers through IP addresses. So in the transport layer, we store a map that maps a peer, a peer ID to a specific IP. So just a map for doing that. And this map is set up by the matchmaking layer. So in the matchmaking layer, uh, when, when, clients, uh, when clients get added, uh, when we find some someone in the lobby system, we will synchronize the IP of that client and synchronize the peer ID of that client and then enter that into the transport layer so that we can talk to them using this, this, peer, ID, this peer ID handle. Uh, on Steam, it's quite different. On Steam, as I said, the peer ID is just the Steam ID because that's a 64-bit value too. And we send data in the transport layer using a Steam API function called send P2P packet, which allows us to send data directly to a peer ID. So in this case, uh, the Steam servers and the sort of Steam backend system will take care of everything that's needed in order to resolve this peer ID into an actual IP address, do the NAT punch through to make sure that we can actually talk to this address and so on. So all of that setup happens happens in uh, in the Steam layer. Of course, it, it can it might fail for some reason. So we need to process callback messages and stuff like that to check if if 
if uh, the setup of the communication fails. Uh, in addition to this the transport layer, we also send authentication messages, which are used to authenticate game servers. Uh, we also send those through the transport layer, as well as voice over IP packets. And the authentication setup is kind of messy. Uh, so the way it works is that the, uh, the connection layer, uh, which is a layer above the transport layer, will actually create an authenticator, will use the transport, the abstract transport interface, but of course only Steam implements this, to create an authenticator. And because we need the transport layer to be set up and we need we want to break the connection in the connection layer because that's where we have our lost connection handling mechanism. So the connection sets this up and sends authentication messages over it. And if the authentication fails, uh, this layer will break the connection. But this is, again, a really ugly, leaky abstraction. We have this authenticator authenticate the composite everywhere even though only Steam uses it and it's kind of weird that the connection layer talks to the transport layer and does this and it's, uh, yeah it's pretty pretty strange flow it feels like um, then we have the uh, matchmaking lobby system as I said responsibility is to find games to join or players to start games with and on some system, like in the LAN system, the, the matchmaking layer is responsible for opening communication parts in the transport layer. In Steam, that's not necessary because we can always talk to any peer Steam ID. Uh, a kind of messy thing is uh, with the matchmaking is that we need a separate communication path uh, for the matchmaking. And the reason for this is that our connection layer, which is sort of our, our layer for sending reliable messages and so on that I mentioned earlier, the connection layer depends on the communication already being set up in the transport layer because connection layer sits on top of the transport layer. But as I said, on some systems, the transport layer is not set up until matchmaking has completed. So setting up the transport layer is part of the responsibility of the matchmaking layer. And that means that we can't start using the connection really because we haven't set up uh, set up the transport layer completely. So we can't use, so if the lobby system or the matchmaking system needs to send messages, which it might need to do, you might have chat functionality in the lobby and we need to send messages in order to synchronize the lobby state like, uh, like that when we set the game session host in the lobby, which is what triggers the actual game to start. Uh, that thing needs to be synchronized to the other lobby members. So there is network messaging going on in the lobby layer, but it can't use the our sort of nice messaging system, which is in the connection layer. So that's kind of messy. We need to find some other mechanism for doing that. And we do that a bit differently on each system. On LAN, we use a separate port for it. So we have a separate lobby port for lobby communication. And then we have uh, the game runs on a game port, so just different ports. Uh, that works for long, but on a lot of other systems, like on, on Steam, we don't really have a port concept, so uh, we use a separate mechanism for that. So on LAN, what happens, what happens, how this is handled, is that the lobby finder, which is a class on the engine side, will broadcast on the lobby port to find all lobbies on the lawn. Uh, so, so it sends a broadcast message and gets reply from all the lobbies. And when the lobbies reply, uh, this lobby finder can start talking to them over this lobby port and ask like, what's your name? Can I join your game? And so on. And the list of members in a lobby is synchronized between these lobby members through messages sent on this lobby port. So when someone gets added to the lobby, synchronization messages are sent so that everyone in the lobby has the same list of members. And we also add these lobby members to the transport layer uh, with just the peer ID to IP mapping. And as I said before, the server sets a flag to start the game 
and that flag gets synchronized through messages on this lobby port to the other members and then we start to create the game session. On Steam, as I said, we don't need to open ports in a transport layer because we already have a peer ID and that's all we need to send messages. Uh, but we don't use a separate port. Instead, we send the lobby sends messages through the regular transport layer. But in order to distinguish them from the regular messages, which are sent by the connection layer, they have a special prefix. So they have a prefix of 7FFFFF. And when we send messages to the, when we send ordinary messages through the connection, we always set the first bit of the message. So that way they're always distinct from the lobby messages. And of course the lobby just doesn't want to send messages, it also needs to receive messages from other lobbies. So the way it does that is that it installs a hook into the transport layer so that if any message comes in with this prefix uh, to the transport layer, it won't be sent up to the connection, which is usually it's a connection that pulls the transport layer, but for these special messages, they will be passed to the lobby layer instead. Uh, so this is pretty ugly, like hacking in the special backdoor for just these messages. Uh, again, an example of not too nice architecture here. Um, Right, next layer, connection layer. And now we are now we now we are sort of above the platform specific stuff. All the platform specific stuff is handled in the transport layer and the matchmaking layer. So now we're now we're platform independent, which is kind of nice because it, the code will look the same on every platform and we don't have to reason about different behavior on different platforms. So, as I said before, purpose of the connection layer is to implement reliable networking on top of unreliable transport, usually UDP. Uh, and it looks something like this. Uh, it has... Um, Functions for sending a reliable message to a certain peer with some data. You get back an ID for it and you can ask for the status of this message and get back a status like has the package been received? Uh, what, what's its status? Uh, then it also has a mechanism for sending unreliable data. And those are sent by, through an unreliable source which we'll which I'll talk with a bit later, but that's basically a source that can provide unreliable data to the connection to, for it to send. And then it has a bunch of other functionality here. You can ask if the connection, uh, if we have connections to a certain peer, if the, that connection is broken, we can like purposefully break the connection if we if something fishy is going on. And can get the ping, current ping time. Yeah. So, so for this system, I'm gonna first describe the sort of basic idea of the system, which is kind of simple. Uh, and that's, that's to give you an understanding of how this system works uh, and a good mental model in your mind. And then I'll describe all the sort of complications that we need to deal with and all the uh, extra features we've needed to add to the system to give you an understanding of why the system has become complex and why it's, uh, why it's, why it's more complicated than you, than you initially would think that it, it would be. So, but let's start with the basic idea. So the basic idea behind reliable transmission is just to assign a sequence number to each message that we send. So we'll give the first message a number zero, then one, two, three, and we'll attach that as part of the message uh, when we send it to the recipient. Uh, on the receiving side, when we receive a message with a certain sequence number, we send an acknowledgement back to the sender that we received this message. Uh, on the sending side, so now we need to deal with messages 
being lost. Uh, either one of these messages can be lost or the, re the reply can be lost. So we need to deal with messages being lost. And to do that, we keep, when we send the messages, we don't throw them away after sending them. We keep them in, in a buffer because if they have been lost, we need to send them again. So we have a timer that after some time, uh, send checks has this has have we get have we gotten an acknowledgement for this message and if we haven't got an acknowledgement for a particular message within some time again this some parameter that you tuned some good value if you haven't gotten a reply in that time we need to resend the message uh, on the receiver side we need to deal with out of order delivery so this sending mechanism like checking for acts and resending, it's enough to ensure that we send every message. But it doesn't guarantee that messages will arrive in order, and we might also have multiple copies of the same message, because if the act gets lost, we might resend even though the message was, was received. Uh, so the receiver needs to deal with messages in the wrong order and receiving multiple copies of the same message. And the way we do that on the receiver side is that we store all incoming messages in a buffer and we only deliver the next expected message. So uh, if, if we've just started, we're expecting message zero, but we get message one, we just put it in a buffer. And then we get message two, we put it in a buffer. Then we get message zero. Oh, great, that's the message we, uh, we wanted. So we deliver message zero and then we deliver message one and two uh, from the buffer. Of course, some care must be taken so that this buffers, these buffers don't grow too big and maybe if they tend to do, we need to break the connection instead and say that that will fail. Uh, so one complication here is that typically we don't want to send individual messages. So we don't want to send a network message for each RPC call or for each game object synchronization because each network message comes with overhead. There's a UDP header and there's processing for each message. So instead we want to add together as many messages as we can fit into a UDP packet and send them all together. And we then also want to do the, the sequence numbering and the acting for this entire packet uh, rather than for each individual message. Because if we do it for each individual message, that means we had to add this message number to each single message. So that means more bits for each message. Whereas if we do it for the entire UDP package that maybe has 50 messages, we only need one header, uh, one ID, uh, one sequence number for that whole packet. So that's 50 times less data used for, uh, used for the message number. Uh, so we definitely want to do that, but again, we need some extra systems to to handle that and keep track of that. Uh, of course, we don't want to we don't want to only send reliable messages because reliable messages are most more cost costly. They need to be they need to be buffered uh, so that they can be resent. They might be delayed and so on. So we typically want to support unreliable messages too. Uh, and the way we do that is that after we fill the UDP packet with all the reliable data that we need to send, we then add un as much unreliable data as we can fit into that UDP packet. So we fill it first with all the reliable data and then we cram in as much unreliable data as we need, uh, as we can fit. Of course, up to yeah some, some limit. Um, and that's what this unreliable source abstraction that I showed is used for. It's used to, it gets called with the packet uh, and says, okay, a packet is going out. This is how much data is in the packet. Uh, this is how much room you can fill with unreliable data. Do you have any unreliable data to send? And the unreliable source will, will fill it with data. Um, we also want to be able to detect if a client drops out, even if we have no data to send. So a client drop, dropping out might not give an error message from, from the low level systems, like from the socket or from Steam. Uh, so we definitely want our own mechanism for finding that. And typically that's a ping pong message. So we will regularly at certain time intervals, ping the client and get the reply back. 
And if the client doesn't reply back within a certain time, we will consider the connection broken and, and cut off that peer. And we can also use this message to determine the ping speed, which is nice. So another complication that can occur, what happens if one endpoint crashes and then restarts? Uh, so what if we have a client at a certain IP, uh, the game crashes and then boots up again. Now we still have a client of that IP, but it's sort of a different client. It's not synchronized with us. It's, um, and that's a problem. Uh, so now the messages are out of sync. Uh, we, uh, the restarted client starts again at zero, but while as uh, our peer that is still, still thinks it's talking to the same process might be at a hundred or so. So it will just send messages and they will never be delivered because that client ex is expecting message zero. So when this happened, we need to, we need to be able to detect that this client, even though it's responding on the same IP address, it's not the same process as before. Uh, so we need some way of knowing that we're out of sync in that way. And in that case, reset the connections on both sides. And, and we do that by, we do that by using a session ID. So when two peers first connect and first starting, start talking to each other, they will do sort of a little handshake face and establish a shared session ID, uh, which is uh, just a unique random number. And we will regularly check uh, that the session ID is still the same, that the two peers still agree on the session ID. And if we at some point detect that they don't, uh, then one of them have, have restarted and they're, no, they're now out of sync, sync so both of them need to reset their connections, disconnect from each other, and then be able to establish a new connection uh, with, with, a fresh, um, with a fresh connection where the message ID starts at zero. So this is one of the complications that, that I mentioned earlier that we didn't really think about at the design of the system, but that we figured out later, oh, we need, we need to be able to detect this situation where a process goes down and then starts some a new process starts up again on the same IP. We need to be able to detect that. Uh, so that adds complexity. Um, quality of service, uh, adapting how much data we send. So we need to try to measure, try to get an estimate of how much data we can send and allow the caller to set the bandwidth cap uh, for how much data to send and respect that when we transmit the data so that we never send more data than this cap. And of course, all of this, all of this code must be reasonably fast and memory efficient. As you said, so earlier that I talked a lot about buffers where we store data and copy it back and forth between buffers and that stuff can get expensive if you're, if you're not careful. Uh, there are a lot of other special situations that, that need to be taken care of. Um, Shutting down, for example, what happens when you when you shut down a peer? If that peer has that peer might want to send a message uh, that says, "Oh, I'm now shutting down. Goodbye." But if you shut down the peer, maybe that message hasn't been sent yet, or maybe it has been sent, but the network transmission should be failed. So, should there be a shutdown procedure to ensure what what should that procedure be to ensure that? messages have been sent before we shut down. Um, uh, there's also priority, which I didn't mention. Um, in this quality of service situation, uh, where we have a limited amount of data, we need, to, we need to decide what data we want to send. And typically some data is more important than others. We need some sort of priority setting for the data. Uh, but in addition to that, we probably also need a mechanism for preventing starving. So starving could be when high priority data uh, completely starves out low priority data. So say for example that we, uh, if we decide a system that we say, well, player position should have high priority and these um, crates should have low priority. 
Now, if that, that might mean that we send the prayer position every frame, and perhaps that fills up our network budget, so we'd never send the crate positions, which means that you won't be able to move the crates at all in the game. And obviously, that's not what we want. So priority shouldn't be all or nothing, just only the highest priority thing. Instead, it should be some kind of balance where we send more of the high priority stuff, but we'll send some of the low priority stuff so that it doesn't completely starve. And what's a good balance there? And that might differ a bit from game to game. And then there's tuning, lots of tuning of all these systems, like how big should these buffer sizes be? Uh, the resend times, when should we resend? When should we resend again if the first resend seemed to fail? And so on and so on. How long does do these connections live? Do, does a connection like this live forever? Or, or do we destroy it at some point? And how do we destroy it synchronously between uh, both peers? So yeah. All of that stuff adds complexity, and that's what adds more code, more things to think about into this code and makes it harder to read. So the next layer is the game session. Uh, so the game session is the one responsible for synchronizing the network game. So it has a number of peers um, handled by this connection layer. One of them is the host for the session responsible for adding and removing peers. And then it supports sending RPCs between the peers and the synchronization of game objects. So the interface, let's look at that. Boom, boom, boom. Looks something like this. You can create a game session. Um, create a game session as a host shut down a game, game session, um, migrate the host, add and remove peers to it, and lots of complications, which I will get to later, but creating game objects, um, accessing them, setting the fields, destroying game objects, and RPC messages, uh, which we have there. Yeah, that's the basic interface. And the basic interface for the game objects on the C side is not uh, super complicated. It has the type, the owner, uh, the blob of data. That's the packed data for the game object. Um, version keeps track of when the game object was changed, uh, when the different fields in the game object was changed and our ID for our last update packet so we can keep track of uh, when we received updates and some other stuff needed for complexity. So the, yeah, as I said, the, the layout for RPCs and game objects are just defined in this config file that we looked at earlier. And that config file on the C side, that config file gets parsed as other config files, parsed into uh, raw struct blobs that represents, so this is a way of representing a parameter, it has type, it has a number of a bit width, tolerance, name, and so on. Uh, and the actual packing on the C side is done by, implemented in a file called packing.h which can pack and unpack bytes and bits. So it can, it has a concept of a network bit stream, just a stream of bits, and then it can pack, pack ints with range reduction, pack floats, and so on, and unpack, do the corresponding unpack to unpack the values. So, I'll do the same thing as I did for the connection layer. I'll go through the basic idea behind the system, uh, the basic functionality, how we, th how we think it should behave, and then I'll get into all the complications, uh, which makes the system more messy uh, than it would seem. So the basic idea here, as I said before, each game object has an owner, which is authoritative, and the only one that modifies the game object. 
So when the owner creates a game object, it sends a create message to all the peers. In fact, the owner keeps track of which peers have acknowledged the create message so it can repeatedly send the create message to ensure that it's created on every peer. Uh, the owner tracks a version number of each field in the game object. So when a field in the game object is changed, the version number is updated. It also remembers the version seen by every other peer in the session. So when it sends an update message uh, that a field has changed, it knows if it gets an act for that message, and then it knows, okay, now this peer has this version of this field of this game object. So uh, we can do a phase where we send uh, updates, all the updates that is needed, by going through all the game objects and seeing if their version, if the version of any field doesn't match the version that a peer has. If a peer has an older version of one of the fields, we need to send an update to that peer. So then we queue update messages, and these are sent as unreliable messages. Uh, queue update messages to be sent to those peers. And finally, at some point, uh, we, want, we want to destroy the game object, and then we just destroy it and send a destroy message to all the peer, peers. So this is the basic game object synchronization mechanism. It's simple enough. Um, there are some optimizations in order to make these things, checking the versions and so on, be as fast as possible and use a reasonable amount of data. But this is a basic process. So let's go into the complications. First, we have migration. So uh, it's not the case that we can keep the same owner for objects all the time. Uh, an owner might drop out, and in that case, someone else might need to take over ownership of an object in order for the game to be able to continue, because otherwise that object wouldn't be able to be modified. So if it was a crate, that crate would just be locked in the level. It doesn't really work. Uh, so we need to do this. We need to do messages and messages back and forth to decide who will be the new owner. And we need to make sure that only a single peer becomes the new owner. And note that messages might be failing while we're doing this. So while we're trying to send messages saying, I'm the owner, no, I'm the owner, can I be the owner? Some of these messages may fail, and we still want to end up with a single owner to this object. Also, the, the peers might not even agree on the state of these, this object. For example, some peers might have received a destroy message and think that, well, this object doesn't exist anymore, while other peers have not received a, a destroy message and think that, well, I should take over as owner of this object, I should own this object, and since I'm the owner, I'm the author I'm authoritative, and uh, since I'm authoritative and I think this object exists, all of you should think that it exists. But an object that has been destroyed uh, can't be recreated because it might destroy like actual uh, a unit or something. Uh, so we need to be able to, able to ensure that this situation doesn't happen, that if some people think that the game object is destroyed, then obviously those people have more updated information and one of them should be the, the owner. So yeah, lots of thinking and messaging to make sure that this happens in the right way. Um, host migration required too. As I said, one of, one of the peers is the host of the game session and is responsible for adding and removing player. And as said before, if one of the host, if the host drops out, somebody needs to take over as a host, so we need messages for that. And we have the same situation as with game object migration, that the messages we send to decide who is going to be the host might fail. So maybe two people think they're gonna be the host, or no one thinks they're gonna be the host. Uh, and uh, as with the game objects, the different, since the host is authoritative on the list of peers, when we select a new post, in a situation where we select a new host, all the other peers might not agree on what the list of peers actually is. So after we pick the new host, we may need to do some synchronization in order to ensure that all of the peers still agree on the list of peers and that the new host now can be authoritative on that list and that everybody synced and, and agree on it. Um, 
Um, so that's complexity. Uh, there's ordering issues here with the game object synchronization. For example, what if the destroy message, uh, what if a reorder happens so the destroy comes before create or update becomes comes before create or update comes after destroy. That needs to be taken care of. Um, what happens, another complexity order thing, what happens if data arrives before the connection handshake has completed? As I said, we need to make a connection handshake to agree on a session ID. And before uh, we've made that handshake, uh, we haven't, we can't start receiving reliable messages because we haven't agreed on the reliable message ordering number because that's what we do in the handshake process. But one party, both parties will never agree on the exact same time that the handshake process has finished because they are only connected by the network so they can only send messages with delay to each other so one party may think before the other party that uh, the handshake message has completed and then send an ordered message to the other party uh, but then that the network layer might reorder the message so that that ordered message comes before the message that would complete the handshaking part uh, with the other party. So the other party might receive an order message before the handshaking has been set up. Um, so this is not the failure situation that I initially thought about. It just shows that it's it's kind of hard to grasp all the possible failure situations that can can occur in, in when you're dealing with network code. Um, so what happens in this case is we just buffer messages if we're still waiting for the handshake to complete and receive other messages, we will just buffer them until we are done with the handshake so that we can start processing, so that we can agree on the messaging sequencing number and we can start processing these ordered messages. But again, more complexity. Um, also for game objects, they are identified by IDs. We need to uh, ensure that they are unique, even when they are the game objects are created simultaneously on different peers and we also want to do this in a way that we don't use too many bits for the id because bits are expensive we will be sending these bits back and forth over the network all the time um, so we do that by like assigning bit ranges to peers so that they won't conflict with each another but again more complexity um, priority i only i already talked about that Client-server model, having both a client-server model and a peer-to-peer -peer model definitely complicates things. It's if statements, branches you need to think about in a lot of the code. Um, another feature we also have, which I haven't talked about yet, is interpolation. So instead of when we get game object field updates from peers, we have two choices. One choice is to use no interpolation, which means that we will apply the changes immediately. So that means we, the data gets in as fast as possible, but that might cause jerky behavior because uh, the update messages, even if the, even if the object is moving, moving smoothly on the sender, uh, the network messages might be randomly delayed, which means that on the, on the receiver, we might get a big delay, and then it jumps to that position, and then it's a smaller delay, so it follows the position, and then a big delay, so it jumps again, which leads to like a jerky movement on the receiving side. So the way to, the way to fix that is to add a delay to the, to the messages so that we don't immediately set the field. Instead, we have a delay, so we set the field, um, say, 200 milliseconds afterwards, uh, after we receive the message, and then that delay is sort of enough to cover any lag in the sending from the, from the server side. So we get a smooth but delayed movement on, on, the, on the receiving side. Uh, so this is something that is optional. You can enable this or disable this on a, on a per field basis. And you can also control the amount of delay you want to do. If you, if you make the delay too short, then you might still get stalls in your behavior course if you make the delay long then you have like uh, a less synchronized view like what one player sees 
is a poor match for what other player sees. Um, yeah, so that's all the complexity, all the things that makes this system complicated and messy and harder to understand. Um, so that's basically covering the entire network system. There are some additional systems that I won't cover in this talk just to keep it reasonably scope. We're, we're already past 90 minutes, so I can't talk for much longer. Uh, but I just mentioned them quickly. Uh, we have a dump system that will uh, you can enable and then it will dump all the network messages to a file, everything you send and everything you receive. And then we have a tool for analyzing that, so you can go into that later and see sort of, oh, are we using too, too much network traffic at some point? Uh, what is the cause for that? Sort of analyze the network behavior. Um, there's also a replay system. So that allows us to replay a network game uh, from dumps. So dumping, you can replay a network game basically by, by us taking all the data that, that was sent as part of the game session and then playing that back, then you, you will have sort of a live replay of your game object status changes and, uh, and your RPC messages. And if you write your gameplay code clever enough, you can use that to recreate the match. Um, so we have a system for that. Uh, we have a, units, a system called a unit synchronizer, which is a system that will automatically synchronize units as game objects. So it sort of automatically creates a mapping from a unit to a game object for you and thus the position and rotation synchronization of, of that unit. So it's kind of a simpler way of, of using, uh, of synchronizing units over the network. Then we have voice over IP uh, on some backends. We have statistics for tracking how much bandwidth we're using and so on, displaying statistics of that. And we have PSN and Xbox Live that I can't talk about. Um, there are things that we are currently not handling, which could be useful to just know about. Uh, we don't have anything in the engine to handle cheating because it's very hard to define. Uh, from the engine side, it's very hard to define cheating. What what really is cheating, especially when you have things like aim bots and stuff like that that might like insert modified network packages on the fly it's like it's very hard to in the game because the engine doesn't know what the game is the engine doesn't know that a player is not supposed to run f faster than 20 meters per second or that the player isn't supposed to teleport or stuff like that so we can't really we can't really define what cheating even is uh, in a game agnostic way so cheating has to be handled by the gameplay layer. The gameplay layer has to sort of figure out what is cheating, when is, do I detect something fishy going on, and so on. Uh, we don't have much handling of hostile peers. So if someone wants to fuck up a network game, like trying to do denial of service or, or sending crafted network packages in order to to crash the engine or get it to do stuff. We don't have a lot of protection against that. Um, uh, that's definitely something. I, she, cheating, I don't think, I have a hard time seeing how we could add cheating protection. Protection for hostile peers, I think we should maybe try to do a bit more about that. At least basic crash protection. Um, uh, and also something we probably want to do in the future is more network backends. Um, Android, iOS, we don't really have backends for those uh, systems. Another thing is uh, there are probably, especially now with, with Autodesk, that we're taking a lot of this technology out of the game space. Uh, since we're only supporting LAN, Steam, PSN and Xbox One, that's a very game-centric focus. Uh, if you're like a customer using the engine for something else, like an architect project or what else, you might not want to use Steam. That might not be something you're, you're at all interested in. So we might want to have other solutions that still allow us to do some kind of matchmaking, some kind of nat punch to 
but without being dependent on Steam. Maybe something that uh, where a customer could even set up their own servers to to handle that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, those are possible things for the future. Um, any questions on all of this? Um, if not, this was the final talk. So um, I'll maybe do a talk on Monday if I if I get questions. If you have any questions on anything, just just send them to me. And if I if I get some questions uh, for Monday, I'll I'll do a talk. Just just the question answering sessions where I, where I'll read each question and and try to answer it uh, as best I can. If I don't get any questions, I won't do that session. So so we'll see. But uh, thank you.